about this Confederate flag in our family. He said, boy, that flag is ours just as much as it is theirs. It, it bothers me to take the agency away from Black people just because of the issue of slavery. I think about what my reactions were when I first discovered my ancestor was, was with Robert E. Lee. I, I discovered that at a family reunion, a large Black family reunion. Hi, my name is Danielle Romero, and I'm so glad you're here with me on my channel today, where I kind of dig into my family's hidden history from Louisiana and all the things that are related to that in genealogy, ancestry, history, and kind of cultural conversations. I did a video a couple months ago on my family where I uncovered ancestors who were Confederate soldiers who were also freedmen of color. It kind of rocked my world. And I wanted to share the scholarship on both sides of this issue of Black Confederates. I think it's important to acknowledge how nuanced this topic can be. People feel really passionate about this, uh, no matter which side of the aisle they're on. I'm going to take the approach of setting aside my bias that I have inherently to the topic, especially as a New Yorker. So in this first video, we're going to be talking to Mr. Al Arnold, a historian and author and a member of a Civil War roundtable in Mississippi. He is a descendant of a Confederate soldier of color, and he wrote a book about it. Let me know in the comments what you think, and I'll see you at the end of the video. My name is Al Arnold. I am from the great state of Mississippi. In about 2015, I wrote my first book, Robert E. Lee's Orderly, A Modern Black Man's Confederate Journey. I wrote that book for my family to kind of preserve our family story through the eyes of our great-great-grandfather, who was Papa Turner to me. What really resonated with me was Martin Luther King when he said, one day the sons of slave owners and the sons of slaves will sit down at the table of brotherly love. And I thought about that, and I, I really felt very compelled that this was that time for me. Papa Turner was a body servant in the Civil War. And he served two Confederate soldiers who I found out much later were from my hometown. And so my journey was primarily written for uh, reconciliation. It was a gift that I wanted to give to my family and to the world through the eyes of my great-great-grandfather, that gift being Christ, the great reconciler. And I looked at this work as a opportunity to reconcile people. It was me reconciling to my Confederate brothers in the South when I found out, hey, you know, my great-great-grandfather was, was in the Confederate Army for four years. I visited over 14 states, went into the homes of many people quite different than me, listening to their story, sharing my story, Papa Turner. So he he was an orderly for General Lee, and and you know he was enslaved by another general, uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest, who I know right. we're all here in that. Show. I used to drive yeah. by. I used yeah. to drive by the statue all the time ten years ago, and no one cared about it. And right. then you know it's gone now. I'm not sure where it is. For my family, they were actually um, enlisting, right? En enlisting free of will. It's a, mm -hmm. We don't know. Who knows what kind of pressures around someone at whatever? Do you see that differently? that topic differently than Papa Turner's story. So so the assumption is always, you know, he was forced to, to be in the Confederate Army. And what I try to explain to people, first of all, when it comes to war, there's no one single reason for any war. Typically, wars build up over time and they have a multifaceted of different reasons. And when you think of people, you have to give people the benefit that people in their day not my optic. They were not single-minded, single-focused. They would have had all kind of reasons to do all kind of different things. It, it, it bothers me to take the agency away from Black people just because of the issue of slavery. For one, all Black people were not slaves. There were free Blacks who served in both capacities, on the North as well as the Southern side. Some Black men would have uh, been, quote-unquote, forced, but were some white men who were scripted into the into the service of their government. Some people would have done it for work. A teamster would have gotten $20 a, a month. That was more than a private would have gotten. Some men would have been of age to where they felt compelled to stay near their plantation to take care of elderly women or family members. People would have been compelled to go north on the Northern Army. They're, people are just people. They're, they're people just like we are now. They're, they have all kind of reasons, all kind of thoughts as to why they would do what they do. I actually found out when I wrote my book, I wrote my book that my ancestor was a slave. I actually found him on a list of free colored people in 1860. Wow. So think about that. I wrote the book assuming 
that, okay, he was a black man. I knew I had a history of, of him being a slave. What I didn't know is that he came out of North Carolina and I was able to trace his, his family all the way back, our family all the way back there. And when I found him, he was on a census of free colors. So he was 21 years old. And I'm saying there are a lot of different circumstances that would create individual decisions. And I believe black people had agency to make those decisions in some cases but not necessarily in all cases, but it doesn't, in my opinion, lessen any part of their service or their efforts. What you're saying about agency to me, I've never thought about that way. Well, well, one of the things that, one of the mistakes I think that people do is that they automatically equate period of time with the whole concept of slavery and they take away the agency of, of, of black people as if they had no agency. And that's just simply not the case. Many of them were given options. You can you can come with me or you can go. You know, if you've been around people for 20 years and you're 30 some years old now and you've grown up with this guy who's going off to war, that's nothing to say there's anything undignified about you saying, hey, I'm going with you. You know, we've been raised up together. Let's go off together. And then there were situations where people were obviously assigned to go off, conscripted, if you will. I leave room for all of the above, as opposed to just trying to come up with one narrative that fits what we want to hear today, whether that meant a man who stayed on the plantation to take care of an elderly mother who could not swim, or if he had children, you know, many of the slaves fortunately drowned because they couldn't swim. They were they were going after the Union Army and, and were left in, in destitute situations. My ancestor seemed to have stayed with the Confederacy four years. Uh, when he died, I found his death certificate. And, you know, a dead man doesn't speak. He doesn't write. He doesn't convey anything. It was very well plainly put on his death certificate, Confederate. And I thought that was uh, amazing because here he was in his grave saying, yep, I was pretty much with the Confederates. And that's, that's the way it was until I died. Black people all the time ask me, what is it like being around those people? I said, just like being around our people. They're just people. Wow. See, I go wow. into the homes. I go into these people's home. I eat their food. I, I sleep in their beds. I go to church with them. I want to be able to make myself available to them and challenge some of their views and push back on some of their thoughts. Tell me about some and, of those. So first of all, when I wrote the book, I didn't know the war was still being fought. The war is still being fought. It's being fought over two things. One, what was the war over? Slavery or economics. Two, is there such thing as a black confederate? I told my wife, I've got myself in a hornet nest because uh, <laughs> <laughs> the northerners are hell bent on shaming the southerners that the war was over slavery. And the southerner is hell bent to shame the North to say, hey, there were Black Confederates. I, I'm not one that subscribes to thousands and thousands of Black Confederates, right? But one of the common things that I have to push back with my Southern brothers is this issue of what was the war over. Another thing is using the term civil war versus war between the states. They really don't like civil war. So I'm talking to the lay person about this period of time. I'm not going to go around talking about the war between the states. I'm just going to use the term civil war because that's the colloquial term historically that puts everybody on the same level to know what we're talking about. It's about slavery. This is the one I've had to push back probably the most because people want vindication. You know, the Southerners want to be vindicated from the fact that the, the moral tariff law, the taxes associated with taxation on cotton, had much to do with the war, and, and, and I would agree with that. But then I asked my southern brother this. If you were Black and you were on the plantation and you were a slave and the war was breaking out, in your mind, what would the war be about? If, if you were a slave uh, in bondage, the war in your mind would mean freedom or at least give you the hope of that, right? So to Black people, the war was about slavery and being free. And you got to allow a Black person to have that argument. What they're doing is they're having an argument between two white foes. 
north and south without allowing a third argument to come in. And I'm saying, you can't do that. I say to my white brothers, and most of them will acquiesce. Most of them will say, Al, you're right. I never thought of it that way. You know, he's so busy fighting the Northerner about what the war is over. And the Northerner is so busy trying to shame him. I'm saying, can the black man have a vote? I mean, do, do we not get a vote as to what the war possibly was about? I think it probably could have been about me. That's fair. Okay, if you agree that Lincoln did not start the war to, to free slaves. And I think that's what they're saying. That was not the initiation of the war, had nothing to do with slavery. It was simply to save the Union. It was not to free slaves. Nobody can historically argue against that. So the, the Northerner, he has no room to boast, okay? Because he was just as racist in that time and in that day as, as those men in the South would have been. I would venture to say we had better relationships in the South, despite slavery, uh, but that's to be argued about and, and that's an issue that we can discuss. Okay, so Mr. Arnold, what are some of the most common reactions you receive from people? All right, we have an uh, African-American guy who's uh, espousing something that seems just like you wouldn't see this, right? This is oil and water uh, in a lot of people's minds. What reactions do you get? I get all kinds of reactions. I mean, if you can imagine, people have their minds made up about things. And, but what I try to do is be very gracious toward people. And I think about what my reactions were when I first discovered my ancestor was, was with Robert E. Lee. I, I discovered that at a family reunion, a large Black family reunion. It was a family heritage book. And they hand out this book with all of our family photos and all of our ancestors in this newspaper article saying that my great great grandfather is an orderly for Robert E. Lee. I started researching and discovering who he was and find out that he was a slave of another Confederate general, uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest. And I was just dumbfounded. And so I have to look at the reactions that I get first based upon, you know, how long it took me to process this information. So I have to give people the benefit of the doubt, right? And and that that's on both sides, black and white. Most people come to the table with a very myopic view of history. They don't have a contextual context of history. They tend to look at history backwards in terms of how they would view things or how they think they would view things. So I have to be patient with people. But if you can imagine the, the biggest issue surrounding the Confederacy, un unfortunately, is slavery. Most people want to talk about that. They want to jump right in on that. And I don't know too many people that have changed their mind about the issue of slavery one way or the other. So mm -hmm. I try not to make that the point of point of contention for me. I try to listen, observe, have more in common than we do, that, than we don't. For those who don't understand that, I try to share with them that, you know, what's wrong with sitting down with people that are different than you? You may find out that you're more, more in common with them. You, you have more in common with them. And that's kind of my story, you know? So yeah, it's, it's kind of odd and awkward. But it's also uh, crazily beautiful in a way. These oil and water relationships, to me, that's where grace occurs. That's where the gospel gets real. For me, it was all about extending grace to my Confederate Southern brothers in the South. Not frowning upon them, not scorning them for the past, but reaching out as as a as a way to say, hey, it's okay to be you. It's okay for you to have ancestors throughout our history and our development. Nothing wrong with that, and you should not be ashamed of it, nor should you be put down and and abused because of it, in my opinion. I think it's a, a tragedy. To I have so many questions. What does Confederate mean today? And what do you think that word Confederate meant to him at that time? Because I don't think it's the same yeah. word. Obviously not. Confederate today means you are the worst scum of, of, of society. Anybody who associate with their Confederate heritage, they are viewed as the worst of the worst because of their willingness and, and their desire not to dishonor their ancestor in their cultural heritage, which happens to be a Confederate heritage. Now, with that being said, the Confederacy, uh, as you know, is a group of organized states, a confederation, and that's where that word comes from. But nothing has stuck like the Confederacy because of the issue of what? Slavery, right? I don't know that that word means meant the same 
then and certainly not to him as it does now. But I think it's a great disservice to take it out of context. Funniest stories I have is a cousin of mine who went home uh, to his mother, who was about 98 at the time, asked his mother about his great-grandfather, great-great, his great-grandfather. It's my great-great-grandfather, his great-grandfather. And mother, what about this Confederate flag in our family? She said, boy, that flag is ours just as much as it is theirs. Well, she was old enough to remember her her, her grandfather was very proud as a, as a Confederate and brought that flag home, if you will, and, and in fact died honoring his service in the Confederate flag. She soon after died a couple of years after I wrote my book. But he got a chance to tell me that story. The issue of slavery has stuck to the Confederacy. And, you know, I'm not saying it's not warranted. That's not what I'm saying. Like you're saying, people are dynamic and multifaceted. And, you know, as I looked into my family's story, trying to understand, well, how could how could you fight for the Confederacy when your when your mom was enslaved? Like that doesn't like and you know, your your family saw me free and now you're gonna yeah. but there's there's more to that. I mean, like these you know, people have land, they have obligations, they have family, all sorts of things. I mean, how much information does someone have as a person of color, even if they're free in eighteen sixty one? How much information do you think they're getting about what's actually the war is about? Maybe you don't even yeah. know what's you know, it's like you just hear yeah. something coming. And so I'm curious, this has been a thing across the whole country, taking down the statues. So yeah. we, you know, I have the Nathan Bedford Forrest one that was here in Nashville. It's gone. Um, how do you feel about that? History tends to repeat itself. History also has a pattern. Who has moral authority? The cycle that goes around to where people really want moral authority over each other. That's the, that's the sinister thing about humanity. And at one time, white folks had moral authority over black people, right? And now black people want moral authority over white people, right? And one day, another group would want moral authority. And what I'm saying is no one has moral authority over another people group. We all are sinners. Uh, we're all in need of grace. We all have contributing factors with respect to history, and none of us are without guilt on our hands from a historical standpoint. And what do I mean by that? I don't believe people are to be condemned for historical connections. You know, my ancestry comes from Nigeria, mostly. My African, West African ancestry comes from Nigeria. I had a white friend of mine told me, he said, hey, there no Pope crackers over in Africa running around in the bush chasing slaves. These were rich men. These were rich men. <laughs> he brings a very good point to the table. He said there were no poor white people running around capturing slaves in Africa. That's not how it happened, Al. And as I looked at it and I realized that Africans had a contributing factor in the slave trade. If I'm going to hold anybody responsible, I got to hold them responsible too. It's just a never ending cycle of blame. And I just don't think that's the way you move forward with building relationships across cultural and racial lines. I don't come to it from that position. And, you know, I don't get bent out of shape when I see people who approach things all the way from that lens because I realize why they're doing it. It's only because of the grace of God that I don't do it. It's only because of the grace of God that I've learned to love people who are just totally different than me. It sounds like your mind was changed, I guess, at some point. What did you grow up thinking or believing? It sounds like you didn't always believe what you believe. No, I mean, I want you to understand that I love history. I love Civil War history even before this story. I had some of the typical thoughts. I mean, the Nathan Bedford Forrest statue in Nashville, I would not even look at it when I came through Nashville. How would you respond to someone who may say, and you, you probably heard this though, they want to see a statue because it represents slavery. It represents all of these evil things that have happened to Black people, which there was a lot of evil things that happened to Black yeah. people. Not saying it's the only group, right? But like when we're talking about in this story here, like this is this is the thing. And they don't want to see it. There's, they're conquering this thing by tearing it down. Well, yeah. here's the problem I have with that. First of all, I don't think everything has to be either or. I think it can be both and. I think you can look at something and, and admire it. And I think you also can look at something and, and remind yourself why you don't admire it. But once you remove it, you can't even do that. Okay? That's one of the problems I have. The other problem is selective moral authority to decide what is removed and what is not. Let me give you an example. 
African Americans particular, I can easily say would have that position and I can understand why historically. And when I raise the issue of, if you're gonna do this, you, you have to do this across the board, right? You can't be selective. So let's take the song Amazing Grace. I was at a, a beautiful funeral today, a beautiful funeral. And we sung that song Amazing Grace. And I have been throughout African-American churches throughout my life. And that song is often the song of choice at funerals and, and even at weddings. Well, that song was given to the church at the hand of John Newton, who was a uh, slave trader. He became a Christian. About seven years after he wrote that song, he stopped trading slaves. It wasn't instant that he wrote the song and he stopped trading slaves, right? So I, how many people of African-American descent are willing to go to their church and, and tear that hymn out of the hymn book and throw that hymn away? That would be an absurd thing to take that song, take it out of the annals of history, out of the church, when God has given us that song through the dirtiest hands of a slave trader. But that's what God does. He takes clay and takes takes us from dirt and make us the beautiful vessels that we are. I get it, but I can see both sides of it. You know, uh, I want to be able to see things I like and things I don't like. I don't want to, I don't want to live in a society where I only see things that make me feel like I am the best that it is. <laughs> live in a society like that. It's not even fair to your children. You know, I, I want to be able to take my children to a Confederate statue one day and say, this is what our people went through. This is what the fuss was about during the Black Lives Matter movement. This is what was happening. This is why. Iconoclasm happened historically in history. It's happened before. Christians did this, you know, Christians went into the Catholic church and tore down statues and you know, this is nothing new. It repeats itself. How do your children feel about this? Is this something that matters to them right now? Is it just kind of like, this is dad's thing right now? I love your questions. So that's interesting because I, I teach my kids to be biblical thinkers, independent thinkers. And I raise them with the with the perspective from a biblical view. God, God grants them agency, right? So my daughter went to the Texas National Convention of the Sons of Confederate Veterans with me. Wow. <laughs> she, she went to the ball with me. My oldest son, he went to the National Convention of the Sons of Confederate Veterans with me. And he was at my table, met a lot of people across the South. And, and I heard my youngest son once tell one of his high school classmates that asked him about it. He said, hey, that's my dad. My dad do my dad. Now, my oldest, my youngest son, he hadn't rolled with me yet. But he he didn't roll with me anyway, right? I guess what I'm saying, I have, my, my family has been very supportive. That hasn't been an issue, but I it's not something that I beat into their head. My daughter called me after she got on her job as a professional and she said, dad, I want to thank you for not teaching us that we were victims. She said, I really appreciate that. She said, I am not a victim and I want to thank you for helping me to see that. It's probably been hard for them in some ways, but they never really came to me and said, Dad, we wish you wouldn't do this and we wish you wouldn't do that. Now, my wife, on the other hand, she's a little bit, has a little bit more anxiety because she's concerned about me and safety and, you know. I am obviously, like, not part of the African community and have only just kind of learned about, like, my roots and, like, my connection to all of this. But what I do hear a lot of is that there is a lot of pain still. Right. And like, I loved what you're, I was like literally in tears hearing your, your phone call with your daughter about, you know, saying, thank you for not raising us as victims. I think that's beautiful. But what do you say to your fellow African Americans who there's still a lot of pain in their hearts? That have been horrible stories. And there's an assumption that they're all good. They're not. I've had people come up to me and tell me horrible stories of their ancestors and what their ancestors did. And I was there to, to, to give them grace and to listen, but not to condemn them, okay? And so I'm not out here trying to answer all the questions of the world. Uh, that's not my aim. And I'm not trying to make it make sense to all of the people who are angry and upset and bitter over what happened 150 years ago. I'm a student of history 
and I can go back a lot further than 150 years if I want to be upset about something. I could you get your mind around the fact that there were Jewish soldiers who fought in the German army and took up arms with, with Hitler. People did what they had to do in their time. And I think it's it's just not a, a good thing to try to read back into history what you think you would have done. As noble as you think you are, you really don't know what you would have done. So I'm proud of my great, great grandfather. Uh, he was proud of his service. And the reason I know that is because he went to the last reunion of the Blue and Grays in um, 1938. It was the 75th Diamondback reunion in Gettysburg. I found his name on the program. They are registered as a Confederate. He was a guest of honor at a local parade in 1941. Blacks and white citizens of his hometown held him to be a hero for his service to, to General Robert E. Lee. I tell all of these stories in my book through the research that I've done. I am not gonna dishonor him because he was my grandmother's grandfather. And she told us about him when I was a little kid. And I grew up to know who he was through a family photo that is uh, displayed on the cover of my book. Uh, that photo uh, was in my family, and uh, that's the only photo that we had of him. He was a very proud man, and he lived to be 102 years old. So it sounds to me, I think people will come to this conversation thinking that uh, you're going to kind of defend Black Confederates, and you've got yeah, all of those things, but it's much more about there are people today who there's a separation because of this topic. Not about right and wrong. I I'm not some of my white brothers have come up to me and say, well, you need to go back and tell the other black people. I said, no, that's not my job. You go tell them. Do you see what they're doing? They want me to be the spokesman for other black people. That's not, I'm not a spokesman for black people. I'm a spokesman for Christ. Christ challenges all of us to love our brothers, to pray for those who, 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 who may use us or, um, you know, for, the, for those that don't necessarily agree with us, we're not to attack them. I went to one book event and this old white lady came up to me and I have a I have a cake recipe in one of my books. It's my grandmother's pound cake recipe, right? And this old white lady, she's about 80 years old. She comes up and says, Al, that cake over there is your grandmother's uh, recipe. She and I were friends. And she went home and got the spaghetti recipe of my grandmother. And I put that in my second book. That's much more of a beautiful story than me condemning that lady because her great grandfather was a Confederate soldier. I think it's horrific that the Southern white man would be the scapegoat for America. A shame on us for doing that. If you could give your younger self some advice, maybe in your 20s, what okay. would it be? I would say be careful looking into your genealogy. <laughs> if you don't want to know anything about God and how he works and what he does and who you are, don't even start because what you think is probably not what you're going to get. Have dialogue and to be able to fellowship and share with people that you don't agree with. I, I don't know for the life of me, where has intellectual dialogue gone? I mean, it's, it's almost like it is uncommon today for people to have relationships with people who don't think like them. Be courageous and have an open mind, not be my optic about life. I would encourage people to uh, go on my website and, and uh, if they want to get the book at orderlyforlee.com. Do your genealogy, start researching, but brace yourself and be prepared because what you find out may be the very thing that you never thought you would know about yourself. To me, I'm a better man and a better Christian because I, I chose this road.